good afternoon, depending upon where each of you are. And uh, thank you for joining us uh, for the last of this year's uh, legislative updates. Fortunately, I think we, we do have some timely items to discuss today. The uh, COVID-19 relief legislation is moving forward through uh, Congress. We still don't have perfect details with respect to it, but the uh, uh, we do. It does appear now that uh, we will have legislation probably by some time. Uh, I would say Tuesday at the latest. The uh, uh, technically the, uh, the the plan is to roll the legislation into the spending legislation that has to be passed uh, in order to keep the government running uh, by Friday. Uh, it, it does not appear that all of the decisions, even with respect to the spending legislation, uh, have been uh, or will be completed in time. And so we're anticipating uh, a very short-term continuing resolution to take us through probably uh, Tuesday of next week. Now, of course, in true Washington, D.C. fashion, because this provides some additional time. Uh, those who are negotiating the COVID relief will take that additional time, even if we pretty much have the, uh, uh, the framework set aside. There are a couple of issues that they continue to debate and probably will continue to debate until the last minute when leadership will uh, inform them that it's, it's time to go. Uh, and then we, uh, uh, we think they will be ready to, uh, to move forward. So uh, what we're going to talk about with respect to the, to the pending COVID-19 relief legislation is based on what we know as of this morning. Things may change this afternoon. Things will almost certainly change in some of the details by the time we get to, uh, uh, we get to the beginning of next week. In particular, the Paycheck Protection Program expansion, uh, a second tranche of those loans uh, is expected to be included. Uh, details of those are still coming out. We do anticipate having another webcast. Uh, I believe it's going to be 1230 Central Time uh, next Tuesday. Hopefully, we will have additional detail by that time. Uh, and can get more in depth into that. But based on what we know today, let's uh, let's go ahead and begin to uh, uh, look at what we, we we do see will be here. The key items, and I think I'm sure you've seen these in the paper, are a, another round of stimulus checks. Uh, the amount is not yet certain, but uh, it does appear that this is going to be uh, $600 as opposed to the $1,200 that we had in the earlier legislation. A few changes in the way that eligibility and uh, payment is going to be determined. For instance, uh, rather than having a reduced amount for dependent children, uh, the current discussion would say you get $600 for uh, each parent, as well as an additional $600 for each dependent child. Although I think that the, uh, my understanding is that there probably will be a cap of three on that. So that the maximum, a family of whatever could receive would be $3,000. Uh, one for each spouse plus three dependent children. Uh, dependent children are expected now to include uh, adult dependents, i.e. your kids who are in college that you are still supporting. Uh, and finally, uh, the $600 number is not locked in. There has been some hope that that can be pushed higher to 700. The, uh, what I'm hearing from, uh, from the people I've talked to on the Hill suggests that that probably is not going to happen, but the $600 is not yet written in stone. Uh, the other piece with respect to uh, individuals uh, that we are going to, we do expect to see additional unemployment insurance assistance uh, included in the legislation. Uh, the number here does seem to be agreed on at $300 per week. Uh, it will not be retroactive. This is going to be for people who are on unemployment insurance beginning January 1, and this will run for somewhere between 10 to 16 weeks. That's still up, uh, up for negotiation. 
And these two are somewhat tied together so that the longer the 300 per week can run, uh, probably suggests that that will make it less likely that the stimulus check number could be pushed up. On the other hand, if the uh, additional unemployment insurance assistance is limited to 10 weeks, then uh, there may be some additional room to increase the, the stimulus checks. Uh, the other big piece in the legislation, I think that it is certainly that is gonna affect those of us in the, in the tax world because of the uh, uh, connection that we have with the forgiveness aspects here would be a new round of Paycheck Protection Program loans. Uh, the, the eligibility restrictions here are going to be somewhat tighter than they were for the first round. A smaller, uh, smaller definition of small business, if you will, 300 or fewer employees, and also a necessity that you, uh, at, when you apply, have shown that you have sustained a 30% uh, revenue loss in any quarter. And that's any quarter of 2020 compared to the same quarter in 2019. Uh, there's some clarifications with regard to 501c6 organizations. And also this time there are a few specific set asides for very small businesses as well as small community lenders. We may see some additional details uh, regarding who qualifies, how this relates to those who may have claimed a, a PPP loan previously. Uh, it does not appear that you will be prohibited from participating a second time, uh, but there are details in that area that are still under negotiation. And hopefully uh, we will have some better information or more complete information at least with respect to that when we get together again on Tuesday. Uh, in addition to a second round, the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, rules uh, for the first tranche, uh, as well as the, the coming tranche, have been changed. The biggest one, and I think this is one that uh, a number of us have been waiting for, is the question of what happens when you pay a otherwise deductible expense with the proceeds of a forgiven PPP loan and the Internal Revenue Service made it very clear that at least their opinion is you don't get the deduction. And by the way, you don't get the deduction if the facts exist that would grant you forgiveness, whether you have applied for forgiveness yet or not. Well, that was not what Congress at least thinks they intended. And, I, Included in the legislation that we see moving forward, we, we, we certainly hope will be included uh, or will be enacted by the uh, sometime next week. Uh, the uh, uh, ability to deduct those expenses would be restored. And this has a retroactive effective date. It's being treated the same as we would uh, any other technical correction. Uh, and uh, it is uh, the effective date as is, is if it was included in the original CARES bill. So consequently, uh, this would apply to any PPP loan, regardless of when the PPP loan uh, was originally issued. There are some additional changes. There was complaint that because the original PPP loans, really you, you had to show that you had spent it on one of four qualified activities. And there was complaint that there were legitimate uh, uses of the PPP loan that were not on the list. Uh, and Congress does seem to be willing to expand that list. So we're also now talking about uh, qualifying costs that are paid for what they call covered operations expenditures. And this is essentially uh, computer software, computer services uh, that facilitate your business operations, delivery of your product, record keeping of any kind, covered supplier costs. Uh, if you had a contract in effect before the loan was disbursed and that contract was to supply goods that are essential to the operation, you can use the proceeds of that PPP. You can have used the proceeds of the PPP loan uh, in order to satisfy the, uh, uh, in order to satisfy that uh, contractual obligation. Finally, if you have spent PPP money or you have spent money 
because money's fungible after all. What we're going to do is we're going to add up what we spent and see whether it equals the amount of the uh, of the PPP loan to determine what our forgiveness is. We can also include covered worker protection expenditures, and that includes any changes that you make to a non-residential physical plant in order to uh, operate safely. So for instance, if you put up plexiglass, if you redesign and restructure your building, uh, those costs are going to qualify for PPP forgiveness. And uh, also that includes any sp expenditures you make on what they call personal protective equipment, uh, masks on up to full body suits. Uh, now, this one is effective for any forgiveness that is provided after the date of enactment of this legislation. Uh, the expectation seems to be that uh, if you qualified for a, if you already qualified for 100% forgiveness, that's the only group that has already filed. Uh, to the extent that some people may have filed for partial forgiveness then there is some question as to whether or not there was a willingness to allow that to go back and reopen that. Uh, the current language does say that it only applies to forgiveness provided after the date of enactment. Not clear whether that would refer to a situation where you went back and applied a second time because you now have these expanded facts and are looking for additional forgiveness. We hope that we will see that clarified uh, as of today. Uh, I think that that is, is still an issue that is somewhat up there. Another key item, uh, another change, and again, this is going to be effective for any PPP loan that has not yet been fully forgiven. That eliminates the December 31, 2020 cutoff date. Remember the way the PPP loan worked was you had 24 weeks to spend the money in an appropriate manner. And, but that period could cut off no later than 1231, 2020. That cut off. So those people who may have come in and applied for a PPP loan closer to the end of the year did not get their full 24 weeks in order to spend the money. This eliminates that 1231 2020 cutoff. I believe it pushes it out actually to September 30 of 2021 and uh, thereby frees up and may provide additional forgiveness for those who entered the PPP program uh, later in the process. Some, a few changes with regard to how you file for PPP loan forgiveness. The uh, Small Business Administration, I believe, had provided uh, simplified uh, filing for very small loans. That is now going to be pushed up to loans of $150,000 uh, or less. And a statement is clearly made within the uh, at least the pending version of the legislation that expenditures on ordinary business expenses are not going to be challenged. Uh, so it, it, as long as you're keeping the business going uh, on that, those smaller loans, we don't expect to see uh, much in the way of, of examination. Now, that doesn't mean no examination, because for instance, if it's clear that you used the funds for something you probably weren't supposed to use them for, uh, for instance, we do know of some circumstances where uh, people have taken the PPP loan and immediately deposited it in their 401k account. Uh, this was not necessarily within the context of what was anticipated. Uh, and uh, that is uh, still going to be subject to, uh, to examination by the IRS or by small business. But uh, other than that sort of misuse, uh, the expectation is that we're not going to see a lot of uh, supervisory, supervi supervising of your loan proceeds, your expenditures in the case of those smaller loans. Now, as we move to the larger loans, uh, there's also some simplification that is intended to apply to the uh, uh, process of applying for uh, forgiveness, uh, mostly focused on the idea that, 
yes, you need to keep your records, but no, don't send them to us because we'll get, we'll contact you if we want to look at them. Uh, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to fill up a couple of additional warehouses uh, in West Virginia in order to, uh, to keep your paperwork. Finally, there is uh, some expanded hold harmless language for uh, protection of lenders. Remember, uh, the Small Business Association is the guarantor of a PPP loan. It is not actually the lender. The bank or savings and loan or other financial institution that you went to for your loan uh, is, the, uh, is the lender. And there are very specific provisions that are going to be included that establish safe harbor, hold harmless situations for the lenders uh, based on the kind of information that they are required to either request uh, or assure themselves that actually exists uh, before they process the, uh, the forgiveness papers. Let's uh, move on. Well, those are, those are key elements that we're looking for. There are a large number of additional provisions that are going to, uh, are, are going to be included, but let's, uh, uh, let's take now, since we've reached the 15 minute mark, and take our first polling question. I mean, I'm optimistic. I'm very positive about this. There are those who doubt Congress's ability to accomplish what they tell us they're going to accomplish. And here's your chance to vote. Uh, do you think Congress is going to pass the COVID-19 relief legislation in time for Christmas? Yes, no, or only if uh, Santa is uh, drafted to uh, actually drop it down the chimney. Uh, and uh, there's no right answer here, but uh, we would like to know what it is uh, you have. Uh, while people are responding to this, do we have, uh, are there any questions that have come in with respect to, uh, to the items in the, uh, in the COVID legislation? And uh, well, I guess a question did pop up. Do we have assurances from the IRS that they are not going to disallow our deductions? And uh, no, we do not have assurances from the IRS, nor do we expect any assurances from the IRS until Congress passes this legislation. If Congress passes this legislation with the current terms in there, I think that it will, it will almost necessitate the IRS clarifying that uh, their guidance, their, their ref uh, ruling guidance has been overturned. Uh, and that uh, you can go ahead and take the deductions on your 2020 return. Uh, if you are a fiscal year taxpayer and believing that they have, the, believing that they have the, uh, the fact, then uh, it may well be that an amended return is going to be necessitated. Uh, that is an unfortunate part of it taking a while for Congress to, to respond. Uh, I think another question uh, that I just saw come through is, well, what do we do if Congress doesn't finish this by uh, 1231? And if Congress doesn't enact this by 1231, then as of 1231, uh, the law, at least the law according to the IRS, is you don't get the deduction. And how that relates to uh, your uh, your filing, uh, your ability to file, certainly with regard to any uh, determination on a financial accounting statement. Uh, I, I have promised that, I have promised I Bailey that I will not give financial accounting advice. So this does not constitute advice, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I, I think you have to, I think you have to go ahead and treat it as a non-deductible expense at least until we get the, the legislation enacted. And if it's not enacted by 1231, then the calendar, the, the fourth quarter for the calendar year is, uh, uh, I mean, the law is what the law is. Now, I would, when it comes to filing the tax return itself, uh, I would certainly yield to your individual tax uh, advisor Yes, I would yield to the, and I would discuss with them as to whether you feel comfortable with uh, claiming the deductions in any case in anticipation uh, of future legislation, or perhaps because legislation has been enacted by the time you file the return, 
uh, if legislation has not been enacted, I would strongly urge full disclosure of what you're doing. Uh, and with that, let's go ahead and move on uh, beyond this year and uh, talk a little bit about uh, what has happened this year uh, with regard to the election and the meaning that that may have for, uh, for the future. Uh, as you know, uh, the, uh, the results are in, the Electoral College has voted and the, uh, uh, the Biden uh, presidency, the Biden administration is now uh, scheduled to take place. And uh, although there remain some, uh, uh, some avenues that still could be explored uh, on behalf of President Trump, uh, I think that at least for the purposes of our discussion today, uh, it is, will be more efficient for us to focus on what a Biden administration might mean. Uh, and uh, if matters change in the future, uh, then certainly we'll, we'll have some other things to talk about. But the, uh, the presidential results are, are what they are. You can see the map, you can see the numbers, 306 to, to 232, which interestingly enough is almost exactly uh, the margin that uh, President Trump uh, defeated uh, Hillary Clinton by uh, four years ago. Perhaps as interesting is what's happened uh, with respect to the House of Representatives. And uh, although the Democratic Party uh, was hopeful that they would see a so-called blue wave, uh, that certainly did not take place. And at least based on those votes that we how we think it will come out, because there are still a couple of seats that are, are open. The, uh, uh, the numbers are, the, the Republicans picked up nine seats and we have a very closely divided house. Now, this creates a significantly more limited field of play for the Democratic majority. I mean, it's, it's easy to say that, well, the rules to the House are such that the majority decides and the minority, we don't care. Uh, and sometimes <laughs> the, the House has behaved that way. But that doesn't really apply in a situation where you can, where the majority cannot afford to lose more than a couple of their votes. And uh, if indeed, uh, we see the uh, uh, the most of the uh, uh, undecided, which are the light colored, uh, are now expected to go on the Republican side. We, there is a four vote majority in the House of Representatives. You lose five, actually you lose three of your uh, of your Democratic members, and suddenly Nancy Pelosi can't pass the legislation. This significantly limits uh, her ability to, uh, uh, to maneuver. It's going to require her, one, to protect and keep the more radical flank in line. Doesn't mean that she can pass things that the more radical flank is gonna be interested in because uh, she can't afford to lose middle of the road Democrats uh, just as she can't afford to lose uh, the, the ones on her left flank. Doesn't mean that we will not see a lot of discussion of relatively centrist ideas, relative discussion of relatively leftist ideas, uh, but actually to come to the floor for a vote uh, is going to require uh, the majority to be extremely careful. Uh, so you may see a lot of smoke coming out of the House this coming two years. I think we're going to see less fire coming out of the House. And maybe we'll just leave the, the analysis at that and move on to the Senate. And this is really where the outlook for future legislation, not just on the tax side, but across a very broad range, is going to be determined. Right now, the score is 48 to 50. And the two empty, the two open seats are subject to runoff on January 5th in Georgia. Uh, if the Democrats can sweep 
then they will hold a 50, they will hold the majority. They will be able to claim the majority because it's 50-50 uh, and we're assuming that uh, Vice President Harris can cast the deciding vote. If they split the vote in Georgia or if the Republicans sweep, then the Republicans stay in charge. And well, why is it important to stay in charge? Well, one, it gives you the chairmanship of the committees. Uh, it gives you a much better budget. Uh, but most importantly, the control of what legislation comes to the floor really is in the hands of the majority leader. Uh, it's not an absolute control, but it, it can come pretty close to that. And so consequently, if the Republicans hold the majority, then uh, there is going to be, there may be a lot of Democratic ideas that find their way through the House uh, that simply never come up for a vote in the Senate. And that may be particularly the, uh, uh, the situation with regard to taxes. And uh, I think you just need to look at how the COVID-19 situation has played out that uh, the Democrats put forward uh, their second round of COVID legislation six months ago. And uh, that really never made a uh, made it to the Senate floor in part because the majority leader said, until I have uh, significant, until I have sufficient support from my majority, I'm not going to bring it to the floor. And uh, that is a uh, that is is within his right. Now there are mechanisms for bringing legislation to the Senate floor despite the position that is taken by the majority leader. They are very, very rarely used uh, and uh, would require uh, participation of uh, Republican uh, senators uh, in any sort of, of procedure that would, would attempt to, to overturn that. So as it stands, uh, we need to, what happens in Georgia is going to have an enormous amount of importance, but still a 50-50 split or a 51-50 split if you uh, add uh, Vice President Harris's vote as a, as a tiebreaker, now you can't afford to lose anybody. And so I think that this puts real constraint on what can't, on the potential for more radical changes that might occur, not just in the tax area, but also in others. Again, it does not mean that we're not gonna have discussions of these things and that there's gonna be news headlines, there are gonna be hearings and groundwork may be laid for things that could happen farther in the future. So it's not something we wanna just completely walk away from, completely ignore. But regardless of how Georgia comes out, the Senate is likely to be the gatekeeper of legislation, including tax legislation. And it's going to have to, it's a, it's a narrow gap that it will have to fit through and probably means that uh, we're not going to, we're not gonna see many of the things that at least were included in uh, President-elect Biden's campaign documents uh, actually enacted. So, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, what do you think the outcome of the Georgia runoff is going to be? You've got the three choices there, and those of you who are still supporting the write-in candidacy of Alfred E. Newman, uh, we will provide a special choice for you. Uh, so, uh, let's take a vote here, make sure our CPE comes through, uh, and uh, then we can talk just a little bit uh, about uh, what a where a Biden administration may be trying to go with regard to taxes, uh, what is possible and what may not be possible. Awesome. Well, we did have a question that came in that says, yes, well, maybe it's not really a question, but more of a statement. I was surprised that my bank required submission of all documentation, even through, even though SBA did not. Uh, that is, uh, well, I mean, it's up to the bank. Uh, and I think that some of the reason that we're seeing some additional hold harmless legislation, hold harmless provisions in the, uh, in the legislation that is pending uh, is intended to give your bank uh, 
uh, a little more comfort with respect uh, to the process uh, and hopefully put them in a position where they will not feel that they need to have uh, that additional documentation. Uh, again, uh, you know, this, is, this is part of, uh, this is part of, an, of any issues we get anytime legislation actually has to be applied in the real world. The real world and the world according to Congress don't always fit neatly together. Uh, the world, world according to the, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to the legends, the, the world, according to the Small Business Association uh, Administration does not always uh, fit clearly together with the, the world in reality. But um, I, I believe that they are trying to address that. Hopefully, uh, we will see a uh, loosening of requirements. We will see a, a little bit more uh, uh, generosity. Generosity is probably the wrong word, but we will, we will see uh, less of a defensive concern on the part of the lenders, which, which certainly until they have comfort that they uh, are not going to somehow be held responsible for something going wrong, uh, it's not a surprise, I'm afraid, that, that this, uh, this is. Uh, but again, uh, hopefully we will be able to see that uh, result. We will get the legislation enacted. And we will we will see that uh, at least some of the cases there uh, resolved. Uh, I guess the the results came through. There does still seem to be significant support uh, for the what we worry what what me worry candidate, uh, and uh, some some general openness with regard to uh, to how this all may play out. Let's move on now and uh, talk a little bit about where uh, the Biden administration. Uh, one has indicated they intend to go uh, and to where it may be practical for them to go as well as some other influences that uh, I think we want to keep in mind as we, we see the thing go forward. And I want to start with talking about a couple of the key administrate the changes in key administration officials. And the most important of these, at least on the tax side, is clearly going to be uh, Steve Mnuchin, uh, is going to step down, and Janet Yellen, former uh, chair of president, uh, is going to step in. And here we've, uh, you know, I think uh, a little bit of a comparison of where they stand with regard to some particular, uh, some particular issues. While Secretary Mnuchin was by no means what we would call a traditional Republican deficit hawk. Uh, he was at least aware and concerned about deficit spending uh, and probably fell into, at least for a Republican, a category of a, of a deficit moderate. Uh, Mark Meadows was the deficit hawk. There's no question that Secretary-designate uh, Yellen uh, is going to be much more dovish with regard to the deficit, uh, is much more willing to, in allow deficit spending uh, to take place, particularly given the current uh, economic situation where we have very low interest loans, where we have significant demand for US government securities, which makes them uh, both cheaper and easier to move to market uh, than might otherwise be the case. Uh, so the idea that, well, well we can't, uh, can't do that because we don't know how to pay for it, uh, I'm not sure that's going to be a strong concern on the part of uh, Secretary-designate Yellen. Uh, I think that that may mean that we are not going to be as likely to see a need for tax increases in order to offset spending uh, initiatives or tax decrease, different tax decrease initiatives. Uh, a second, uh, I think, important difference here that you need to note is uh, under uh, Secretary Mnuchin and under the, the, uh, uh, the Trump administration, uh, there has been very limited engagement in international affairs. Uh, there has not been a, uh, the, there, there's not been felt a need to participate with the OED in the development of the OED standards that 
at some point at least are likely to be uh, adopted by a significant portion uh, of, the, of the other developed world. I think we have a very, very different view that's going to come from the Biden administration and in particular from Secretary Yellen. I would expect to see her engage and her Treasury Department engage with the OECD uh, and to try and negotiate positions that will be more favorable to U.S. companies as opposed to um, you know, suggesting that, well, if you guys want to go to war, we can go to war. Uh, I think you're going to be, uh, which is, is more of the approach that was taken uh, in the Mnuchin department. So I think that we will see this particularly is going to apply to the taxation of uh, intangibles, uh, the worldwide taxation of intangibles. I think we are more likely to see an attempt to, uh, one, modify where the OECD is going with respect and to the benefit of domestic corporations, uh, but also a willingness to uh, come closer to having a, a, a similar treatment uh, worldwide uh, than may have been the case under the Trump administration. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, the back, they're very, very different backgrounds. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin uh, was a former Goldman Sachs partner. Uh, investment banking really had been his, uh, uh, his background, whereas uh, Secretary Yellen uh, is an academic economist. Uh, she was the former Fed chairman, uh, but she has not had the kind of private sector involvement that Secretary Mnuchin had. And uh, this does make a difference. Uh, it's not necessarily worse or better, but it is different. And we may see more exploration of theoretical ideas uh, under a uh, Biden administration. Doesn't mean they're going to be enacted, but at least an exploration of some different ideas than, than we would have seen uh, under the, uh, 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 that we have seen under the Trump administration. Uh, with regard to the White House Chief of Staff, uh, Mark Meadows, uh, who was a prime deficit hawk, uh, the, one of the original leaders of the Tea Party, uh, did have an influence on the Trump administration uh, that was a separate voice. The designated Chief of Staff for President Biden is Ron Klain, who has been a Biden advisor for a significant period of time. And here, I think really the, the message is uh, Klain's politics are Biden's politics. Uh, I don't expect, I, I would expect him to have an influence, but it is not necessarily the kind of outside influence that uh, we were used to seeing uh, from uh, Chief of Staff Meadows. And as a consequence, uh, we may not have that competing voice uh, that at times Meadows provided. Uh, let's talk briefly about the, uh, the specific proposals that uh, President-elect Biden ran on. Uh, some of these are likely to be considered. Others of these are probably not going to be considered. And, and certainly it looks like it would be a stretch to see them enacted. Uh, the one that has probably got the most attention uh, is the proposal to increase the corporate rate to 28%. Uh, this was in the, uh, at least in the campaign materials, uh, somewhat locked in with the idea that the increased money would be spent on expanded health care or some other uh, initiative. Well, it, it's there. And the idea of increasing some increase in the corporate rate is is probably one that uh, uh, is likely to have some legs, although uh, an increase to 28%, I think, uh, may well be a stretch. Uh, the uh, Some other ideas, a, a new book-based alternative minimum tax on uh, corporations with earnings of over $100 million. Uh, those of us who have reached a certain age and maybe have our Medicare cards by now, uh, do uh, remember the uh, book untaxed reported profits provision that applied in the corporate alternative minimum tax from 1987 to 1989. Remember how successful that was. 
and uh, there's no indication that uh, Biden's people have uh, figured out how to address all the problems that that one had. Uh, and I would not uh, hold my breath waiting for the uh, minimum tax, a book-based minimum tax to be enacted. I would expect to see some changes with regard to international activities. And finally, and this one I think is, is a concern, the restriction on the use of, of the pass-through deduction by higher income taxpayers. And this would apply across the board right now for service providers. We have a uh, essentially an income uh, cap, whereas when you go up across the cap, then you lose and eventually, or you reduce and then eventually completely lose uh, your section 199 cap A uh, pass-through deduction. Uh, this would extend that uh, to all pass-through enterprises or the owners of all pass-through enterprises. Some real issues that this, uh, this raises, uh, I think that in talking with uh, Democratic uh, members of Congress, uh, I think there is a general understanding that the pass-through deduction was put in in order to at least provide a semblance of similar treatment at the business level between um, C corporations and pass-through entity or uh, businesses organized as pass-through entities. Uh, but there is concern that the bulk of the benefit is uh, being taken by higher income taxpayers. Uh, whether uh, this is the appropriate approach to dealing with that or not is, uh, uh, I think an open question. And I would not treat this as something that is decided, but it is certainly something that I think we will see uh, at a minimum part of an open discussion as we go forward the next two years. More attention probably has been paid to the individual tax provisions that proposals that were included uh, in Biden's plan, uh, the increase to 39, back to 39.6%. Uh, on taxable incomes over 400,000, uh, a uh, tax on our treatment of capital gains and dividends in excess of a million dollars as, as ordinary income, uh, limitations on itemized deductions, welcome back to the, to the world of peas, and some changes with respect to uh, uh, estate taxes. First of all, to take the, we say take the rates back to historical norms. I think what we're really talking here about is taking the exemption amount back to historical norms, although they haven't told us what historical norms are, but also an elimination of the step up in basis for large estates. And uh, that one is a, uh, uh, that's, a that's, that's a difficult process to implement. And like the, uh, the book, uh, Alternative Minimum Tax, uh, perhaps is one that uh, is still going to require some, uh, some additional work before it uh, is quite ready for prime time. Perhaps uh, one that if enacted would be uh, a, a very significant change would be to uh, create or would be to subject to medic, uh, excuse me, to uh, social security taxes, uh, income in excess, earned income in excess of $400,000. Uh, there are some ish specific issues that apply here, not the least of which is uh, keep in mind that in the United States Senate, you can pass something with 51 votes, but you need 60 votes in order to agree to take the vote. And the way that, since tax legislation has rarely included a 60 vote majority in the Senate, at least initially, the way it has typically been enacted is through what they call the budget reconciliation process, which allows a vote of just a majority vote to, to move the legislation forward. Now, there are all sorts of bells and whistles that this attracts, not the least of which is this fact that you typically have to have the entirety of the legislation expire after 10 years, which we saw. Uh, well, we see some of that in the AJCA in, in 2017. We saw that very much in the, uh, in the early Bush tax cuts. Uh, but uh, one of the specific rules is you cannot affect Social Security using budget reconciliation. So uh, that is a additional barrier. And while certainly it is a concept that needs to be uh, 
made you need to be aware of uh, as if it develops we certainly want to follow uh, but I think it is one that uh, is going to be particularly difficult uh, to to enact uh, the message of all that I think really is don't panic we are not going to see the entirety of Biden's campaign proposals uh, enacted within the first 90 days of the uh, enacted within the first 90 days uh, of a Biden administration. Not the least of which, and this <laughs> neatly ties into the don't panic idea, uh, the, uh, the economy is not doing well. Uh, this is the, the conference board's uh, forecast, as you can see. Unfortunately, the downside forecast that they did back, this is from back in September, we probably are not even going to reach that given the, uh, the reductions and, and, and some of the data that came out uh, this week with regard to the state of the economy. So taxes are not going to be job one. The immediate focus for any, and, and President-elect Biden has made this very clear in his statements, the focus is going to be on addressing COVID-19. Whether this legislate, whether the legislation we talked about earlier today is enacted or not, we're going to be back in front of Congress in the late winter, in the spring, with probably another round of additional COVID-19 assistance there is just generally a reluctance to increase taxes during an, an economic downturn. There are a few economists who are arguing that is not the case. They do not constitute a majority of the electorate. Uh, the majority of the electorate, I think, is, is squarely behind the idea that increasing taxes during an economic downturn is not a great idea. And then finally, we also talked about the idea that some of the uh, proposals in the campaign are not exactly ready for prime time and uh, some of those are going to require some significant time uh, in order to be refined. And then let's, let, let's face it, taxes were not a primary feature of the Biden campaign. They were there. In many ways, they were a protection against proposals and an attempt to not lose the votes of those people who had were supporting Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren. But they, he, but President, President elect Biden was not running on tax increases. And uh, I think that we're going to see that as, uh, as it implies. There are other things that are going to be more important to the Biden campaign. I know we're used to the idea that taxes are the most important thing in the world. Uh, it's why we do what we do. Uh, but I'm not sure that that really is going to be the case. And finally, we also talked about the Senate being a gatekeeper, not only through the 60 vote majority is needed to take the vote unless you use uh, budget reconciliation, but also uh, just because it is going to be so closely decided regardless of how the Georgia election comes out. If you look at what the policy priorities are, and this is this is my view, uh, it's all I really can, can offer here, but it's based on my having followed this for 30 some odd years now. Republicans and Democrats just view taxes, their, their priorities are different. And things that we've gotten used to under Republican administrations may not necessarily apply under, uh, under a Biden administration. Taxes are, Democrats view taxes as a way to pay for things, not because they have a particular religion, with respect to taxes, whereas Republicans do, they have a, there is a belief that as a matter of faith, taxes should be as low as possible. Democrats are much more open to the idea that taxes can be used as appropriate ways to encourage behavior, whereas uh, Republicans tend to see that is, uh, tends to uh, uh, create market inefficiencies. Uh, and finally, there is a general <laughs> willingness on the part of more Democrats than Republicans uh, to spend def for deficit spending. Uh, and uh, that's simply the thing. So let's take a, you know, a quick look back through the business tax proposals. Again, um, the uh, uh, increasing the corporate rate in a time of, uh, uh, time of recession, uh, particularly a pandemic generated recession, uh, 
I would not hold my breath for this. I would not necessarily run out and try and recognize a lot of income by the end of uh, 2020 in order to avoid a, an increase. Uh, we might see one. Uh, there is discussion within the uh, Democratic leadership that if one comes that maybe 25% would be a more reasonable number than, than 28%. After all, 25% was the number that the Republicans used when they originally put forward their uh, uh, tax reform proposals that ultimately became the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Book income provision, you know, a lot of questions, a lot of, a lot of details I think have to be worked out on that one. Uh, international activities, very difficult. Uh, there are clearly some uh, issues that exist with the way uh, the transition from a worldwide to a more territorial based system were done in the context of the TCJA. Uh, some of those are going to need to be addressed and that is going to provide an opportunity uh, for the Democrats to perhaps put a little bit more of their stamp on how we tax the international activities of uh, domestic corporations. Uh, but again, this is one that's gonna require some time uh, to work through. Now, the restriction on the use of the pass-through deduction by higher income taxpayers, that one I think is going to, maybe one that we will see on the table uh, and for businesses that would be affected by that, uh, I think that is an area where uh, it will make some sense to devote some attention, maybe attention sooner rather than later. Uh, with regard to the uh, uh, to the individual tax proposals, uh, the increase in the rate on taxable income, whether four hundred thousand dollars is the magic number or whether that goes higher, is a uh, uh, of these that is the one that would seem to have some possibility of consideration. But again, I think that the Senate as gatekeeper is going to make it uh, difficult for that to move through. Certainly the rest of these proposals, except for possibly uh, changing the uh, state tax exemption amount uh, are going to be extremely difficult to move through the Senate gatekeeper. Uh, and I would uh, not necessarily hold my breath uh, or disturb what otherwise may be uh, solid price. Now, what uh, what can we uh, what can we expect? Well, uh, as I said, Democrats uh, like to use taxes for incentive purposes, and we're going to uh, see that. And areas I would look for additional uh, development of tax based incentives would be in the housing area, employment area, and certainly in the the so called Green New Deal area. Uh, whether that will extend to the pet powered drag racer uh, or not, I'm not sure. I'll talk about a few other ideas here. Uh, the international area, as I mentioned, uh, the Biden administration clearly does recognize the need for the US tax system to allow US companies to compete internationally. We're not talking about going back to a pre 2017 situation where General Electric and Siemens sold the same identical item in Brazil for the same identical amount. And Siemens faced a combined tax rate of 22% and uh, uh, GE faced a combined tax rate of 30%. Uh, we're not going back to that world. Uh, and they there is a general acceptance of yes, that didn't work. We were putting US-based multinationals at a significant disadvantage compared to their foreign competitors. And it's understood why many of the changes in the TCGAA were made. Now, are the changes that the Republicans made, and then there's no question, the Republicans pretty much did the international changes on their own without much democratic uh, influence. Are those working like a Swiss watch? Well, probably not. And in fact, I think most Republicans would say they are not working like a Swiss watch. Uh, there are uncertainties and imperfections that are going to need to be addressed. And this is gonna create an opportunity for the Democrats to try and influence how those changes are made, maybe even to influence uh, not the basic concept, but again, uh, some of the smaller ones. 
Uh, and so within that context, I think that that is something that we want to see. Transportation infrastructure. The Biden administration needs something that can be done on a bipartisan basis. Uh, transportation infrastructure is typically one that uh, can attract some attention. Interesting here that Secretary uh, Designate Yellen is one of the leading advocates for a carbon tax. Now, carbon taxes are almost universally accepted by economists, which again, are not a majority of the voting public and does make it difficult at times to move those forward. There is also some question as to whether the designated transportation secretary, the former candidate, but a judge, is uh, uh, in fact may be a favorite of the moderate wing of the Democratic Party for four or eight years in the future. Uh, and so there may be uh, some goal of at least portions of the Democratic Party of putting some additional, doing things that will allow him to stand out. Uh, so uh, within that context, I think that that is, is something we want to look at. And certainly given the, uh, given the experience uh, that our friends in Minneapolis had several years ago, some additional transportation infrastructure spending is probably, uh, probably appropriate. How we deal with that on the tax side is something that's gonna have to be addressed. And with that, Amy, I think that we have uh, covered what uh, we saw we needed to cover today. Uh, I hope everyone had an opportunity to, uh, to cast their votes on all of the polling questions uh, to get that, get that all important CPE as we get towards the end of the year. And uh, uh, hope that everyone will be able to join us uh, next Tuesday when again, hopefully, we have a final version of the uh, additional PPP legislation.